Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Confronting Evil. Tonight, we circle back to the gates once opened, and one can only wonder if the twins are ready. So, you get ready to hit the road. It's finally time for another episode of Confronting Evil. Honey, I don't think anyone is here. The young woman said to the man that accompanied her, holding her arm in an upright position. It's a hospital. Somebody has to be here, Nick reassured his girlfriend. Erica, Nick's girlfriend, had cut her hand pretty deeply while washing dishes, and although they were at the hospital's emergency room, hoping for some help, there was literally no one to be seen, neither waiting to be helped or behind the check-in counter. Maybe they're just full with people. I'm sure someone will be along soon. Nick reassured his girlfriend who was now dripping blood all over the floor. Hello? Erica called out beyond the desk, into the empty space, hoping to get someone's attention, not willing to simply wait until someone decided to show up. Hello? A low voice resonated and grumbled. See, I told you someone was around, Nick stated to Erica. Yeah, but something is wrong, Nick. That voice didn't sound weird to you. And where is everyone else? Maybe it's just a slow night. Come on, Erica. I'm sure there's just an echo or something back there. Nick reassured her. But as he finished his sentence, the power went out. We need to leave. Like, right now. Erica demanded. Relax. There was a blackout across town, too. I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. Oh, but there is something to worry about. Nick paused and re-evaluated his proclamation because something very unnatural sounding commented back from the darkness behind them. Did you hear? Nick began, but as he started to speak, Erica was torn violently and quickly from his side into the darkest corner of the room where the shadow was infinitely black. Nick couldn't see what was happening, but he could hear it. The sounds of tearing meat and bones being pulled from socket. Brave as he was, Nick charged into the blackness, only to meet an identical fate. Being torn to shreds and spraying all that surrounded him in a shower of crimson. <laughs> the thing laughed from the darkness, leaning forward to see the display of the macabre he had created, a grinning expression frozen on his wrinkled face beneath two opal black eyes. By the time the officers had arrived on scene, the hospital was one half chaos and one half massacre. Sheriff Philstein spent much of the night categorizing evidence, identifying bodies, and talking to the witnesses that remained on the grounds. The sheriff heard outrageous stories of a couple brought in from the hospital across town, which was also still currently a crime scene, and once the older woman of the pair had been resuscitated, she started murdering staff and patients alike. The sheriff had trouble understanding how an old woman was capable of such brutal attacks, even if aided by her husband, who was older than she was. But the two witnesses that swore they saw what happened said the woman seemed to possess unnatural strength. When Sheriff Jesse Philstein pressed for more information, one of the witnesses hesitantly delivered a detail that the sheriff was actually glad no one else had heard but her. Jesse informed the two witnesses, a male and a female nurse, to keep the information to themselves. If the rest of the department heard this claim, everything the witnesses said would have been called into question. For the sheriff, however, this only solidified her initial assumption. But Sheriff Jesse Philstein wouldn't have to make any subsequent calls. 
as the dark teal Ford Torino rolled to a stop adjacent to the small convoy of squad cars and first responders, barely no one noticed, and only a few turned their attention to it before resuming their investigative duties. Seth and Mackenzie opened the doors and climbed out, Mackenzie stuffing her keys into her pocket, feeling the rigid shape of the iron knife concealed inside her jacket. Seth took the lead and approached the police force, reaching for his wallet so as to pull free his fake ID. Mackenzie prepared to do the same, but before either could pull their wallets free, the sheriff turned and spotted them approaching the boundary of the crime scene marked off by police tape. Hey, I was right about to call you, the sheriff yelled out. Seeing two familiar faces, she hoped she could coax into coming out her way. They seemed to have saved her the time. You know these two, sheriff? One of the officers asked, ready to stop the twins and ask what they were doing there. That I do. They're... Consultants. From out west. Sheriff Philistine asks us to come in from time to time. Try and lend some insight on some of the stranger cases she hears of. Seth spoke up, not providing a name. Well, this certainly qualifies as that. But how did you get here so quick? The officer pressed. That's enough. I'll take it from here. I called them a few hours ago about the hospital killings across town. Jessie explained to her deputy, lifting the crime tape and allowing the pair to walk underneath. The deputy obeyed his superior, and though he still had a lot of questions, he dared not ask her for fear of getting on the sheriff's bad side. So, what are we dealing with? Mackenzie asked once they had gained enough distance from prying ears. Now hold up a sec. Don't I even get a hello? How the hell are you? Are you okay? It's so great to have you back. Jesse began blurting out a plethora of questions and statements, all held in reserve ever since she heard that Mackenzie was alive and back. Sorry, Jesse. You're right. I, I heard you came to my funeral. I really appreciate that. Was it nice? Seth wouldn't tell me. Oh my god, it was absolutely beautiful. You would have really... Yeah, she's back and hungrier than ever. Sorry to cut you off, but have you gathered any useful info? Can we catch up later? Oh yeah, sorry. I'm just so happy to see your sister again. Yeah, Seth. She's happy to see me. Could have let her tell me how great it is to have me back and stuff. Just a little longer. Always hogging the limelight. No, your brother's right. Let me tell you what I know, then we can go catch up over a cup of coffee or something. Throw in some food and you have a deal. Ahem. Oh yeah, sorry. From what we've gathered, an elderly couple was brought in. Clive General, across town, after a car accident. No one knows the details, but apparently the male had been resuscitated and stabilized and began to murder everyone on site. A lot of people made it out alive, but not many who ever caught a glimpse of him. However, his wife was one of those survivors and was brought here a while ago. From the few witnesses I've talked to, the same thing happened here. The woman was resuscitated and once she was stable, she woke up and began killing everyone. The place was pretty light staffed tonight. Not many patients either. Benefit of a small town, I suppose. So there aren't many witnesses to speak of. But the two over there told me something really strange. Jessie finished, pointing at the nurses that she had spoken to earlier. Yeah? What's that? Mackenzie asked. Apparently, she had black eyes, like all black eyes, like opals were their words. Demon possession? Huh, that's weird. Usually there's omens and odd weather that accompany the presence of a demon, and unless they were summoned. So you think someone summoned this? It certainly seems that way. But who would do that? Hey, 
I'm not sure. But let's discuss the matter over some food and a coffee. We can share what we know about demonic possession. Now, that sounds like an enjoyable dinner conversation. Let me go talk to Deputy Kramer over there and let him know I'm going to follow up on a hunch. And I'll meet you at this great bar around here. I'll text you the address, or better yet, wait and follow me over there. This place has the best burgers. Jesse said, after pointing to Deputy Kramer, the young cop who almost met the twins at the border of the crime scene. Wait, you still like burgers, right? Oh my god, yes. Her appetite hasn't altered in the slightest. Seth proclaimed, before Mackenzie could even speak. We're in. Mackenzie agreed. Jesse made her way over to speak to Deputy Kramer. They'd only recently met, but she talked to him like they'd been working together for years. The officer heard all she had to say and swore that he would wrap things up on scene for her while she went to speak with the agents, as she put it. Seth and Mackenzie, on the other hand, had reached the car climbing inside and waiting for Jesse to pull in front of them so they could follow her to their destination. Worked, right? A man with one blue eye spoke from the back seat. Did what work? Mackenzie asked in response. The sheriff. My little magic trick worked, right? They all accept her as part of the department? Blue Eye elaborated. Yeah, it seems to be working fine. Definitely helpful for moving around resources, though it wasn't necessary, Seth said. Yeah, Seth, but she wanted to come, and she did let us in on a lead. Blue Seth Eye back reasoned. here offered to help by magicking her way into the department for leads. Seems to have worked out pretty good, I'd say. Eh, true, I suppose. The more help, the better. Exactly. So, where are we going? For food and drinks. So, do your best to keep a low profile, will ya? You got it. No murder. I promise. Blue Eye replied, causing the twins to both give each other a mutual look of possible disbelief. Before either could say a word, Jessie pulled up alongside the Torino and beeped the horn, indicating that she was ready to have the twins follow behind her. Together, both vehicles left the lot, planning to hide in plain sight to discuss the evil they hoped to uncover before any more lives were lost. Across town, three friends drove through what were nearly empty city streets, ignorant to the menace on the loose, focused entirely on having a great time at the Rebellion Club, located downtown. I heard Monster Jam was supposed to be playing live there tonight. The skinny blonde, Madison, said from the passenger seat. No, I'm pretty sure that was last week. Her boyfriend, Keith, responded. Keith was the only member of the group to own a vehicle, and though he was tall and athletic, and the club isn't too far from where they lived, he preferred to drive anyway. Is there anyone playing live tonight, then? Adrian, Madison's best friend, asked from the back seat of the light tan 96 Buick town car. No, I don't think so, but it is ladies night, so drinks for you two will be half off. Yay! Madison exclaimed with glee. Adrian smiled as well, but more as a conditioned response in opposition to excitement. Adrian was mousy and reserved, and although she was very pretty, she lacked confidence in herself. Well. Were you both ready to party? Keith asked, pulling into the parking lot and placing the Buick in park. Madison exclaimed that she was ready and got out of the car to wait for Adrian, who followed closely behind them both as Keith paid the admission fee and all three walked into the club doors. The club was absolutely jumping. Music thumped so loud, it vibrated the entire floor and made it so that no one could hear anything else that anyone was saying without yelling directly into their ear. Keith made his way to the standing bar in the corner, adjacent to the dance floor, and 
after waiting for his turn to order, asked for a rum and coke for Madison, a sex on the beach for Adrian, and a fishbowl for himself. The fishbowl was a large concoction of varying alcohols, and large enough to satisfy five to ten people. But this was Keith's regular, and he prided himself on sipping out of such a large container that would last him most of the night. Hey, check out Green Acres over there. Madison yelled to Keith, pointing towards the entrance and the older, quaint-looking couple that just entered the establishment. Yeah, they certainly look a little bit out of place. Wait a minute. What's wrong with their clothes? Madison asked, noticing that the pair looked pretty disheveled, and the gown worn by the woman seemed splattered in crimson. Adrian was about to comment as well, to say that maybe the three of them should leave the immediate vicinity because of the ominous feeling the older couple gave her, but it was too late. None of them understood when the man raised his hand, closing it into a fist, and the entry doors slammed shut behind him. In fact, most of the patrons failed to notice at all, too busy having a good time. The older woman began walking forward, an evil grin across her face, below her silver hair. Adrian, Madison, and Keith all noticed the strangeness of the woman's eyes due to her closer proximity to them. They were opal black, all pupils, and no iris. Well, shit, she must be on some high-end stuff, Keith said jokingly. No, there's something wrong with her, with both of them. Adrian finally spoke up. At this, the woman turned a burning attention towards Adrian, as if she'd heard her above the cacophony of clubgoers and loud music. The three of them noticed as soon as she turned and began backing away accordingly. However, a drunken dancer hadn't seen her nearby and backed into the woman inadvertently. As soon as he touched her and turned to apologize for bumping into someone, the woman turned her focus with a snap, and before an apology could even leave his mouth, she gripped his head firmly and turned it sharply to the side, snapping the man's neck and tearing his head free from his shoulders in one quick motion, spraying blood from the giant wound in his neck where his head was once connected. Run! Keith yelled out to Adrian and Madison, making haste for the door, but were stopped by a smiling older gentleman before them with the same opal black eyes. Keith had a hold of Madison, and as quickly as he stepped aside and away from the man's grasp, Madison was yanked with him. Unfortunately, Adrian wasn't so lucky. He caught the girl by her neck and lifted her into the air with one hand, effortlessly. Let her go! Madison yelled, taking one step forward as her boyfriend stopped her, still holding her arm, because in that same moment, the man squeezed Adrian's neck so hard with one quick pump of his hand. Adrian's head released the pressure, executed in multiple ways simultaneously. Her eyes burst out of her skull as her tongue bulged out of her mouth. Brain matter fulminated from her nostrils and ears so quickly, pieces of it splattered to the floor at a five-foot distance from her face. Adrian had become instantly unrecognizable. My God, what the fuck? Keith yelled retreating towards the back doors, away from the man who now held a younger man in his grasp, having dropped what remained of Adrian to the floor. The elderly woman with black eyes was focused on ripping people apart by the dozens on the dance floor with delight, giving Madison and Keith the perfect opportunity to escape. There had been a mob of clubbers trying to abscond from out the back exits, and by the time that they had gotten there, they were now at the back of albeit what was now a much smaller crowd. Madison turned around in panic, terrified that she would be targeted next, and what she saw, she knew in an instant she'd never be able to forget. The man who had killed Adrian had torn the boy's arms off like the wings off a fly, and now that he couldn't fight back, he'd begun to slowly eat the kid's face tearing off large strips of skin and muscle fascia with a snap, chewing on it like chicken skin and cartilage, slurping 
the dangling pieces into his mouth before swallowing, smiling at the screaming person he held tight in his hands before going back in for another bite. The woman on the dance floor had just finished tearing a girl's head from her shoulders while another watched, helpless, being held under the woman barefoot. The girl shrieked for help and pleaded to be let go, but the old woman simply reached down and into her abdomen like there was no resistance at all and began pulling small intestines out as she withdrew back her bloodied hand like she was simply pulling clothing out of a suitcase. The girl trapped beneath her feet gagged and screamed in agony as best she could and as she opened her mouth for air and another yell, the woman quickly stuffed that which she held in her hands into the girl's mouth. She gagged and tried to spit out the organ that was still attached to the rest of her insides, but the old woman held her hand over her mouth and pinched her nose shut with the other. Madison watched in horror as the girl tried swallowing and choked on her own insides. A digestive system looped in on itself. Madison shrieked and pushed at Keith, and her yell got the attention of the old woman who now had begun staring her down and walking in her direction. But as the last of the people rushed out the door, Madison and Keith right behind them, the two of them found the sight of four people rushing in through the doors, going the opposite direction. There were two women and two men. The younger woman wore a dark denim jacket and had shoulder-length blonde hair. The man right behind her looked about the same age, only slightly taller, and hair slightly darker, a flannel under his dark jacket as well. Behind them rushed a tall, well-dressed man who looked wholly out of place and seemed to have one bright blue eye of the two set within his face. And lastly, behind him was a woman dressed in a non-typical police garb like that of a sheriff. Keith and Madison didn't stick around to ask any questions, however, and turned for the door. But as they did, they were pushed back by it, like something mechanical had pushed it closed despite their opposition to it, throwing them back inside with a hearty nudge and slamming them tight, closing them inside with those who had just entered and those which remained. Keith and Madison quickly learned, however, that every one of the club goers had either now escaped or had been massacred as blood, body parts, sinew, and connective tissue covered the floor and most of the surrounding surfaces. But not one living person remained. Shit! No! We're trapped! Keith yelled, banging on the door with his fist, Madison joining him immediately after. Go help them, will ya? Seth yelled to the well-dressed, blue-eyed man. Yeah, no problem. The man fumbled on his words, turning with a stumble to open the door. Try as he might, the door wouldn't budge, held by a power being currently used in opposition to his own. Next, he turned around and pointed a shaky hand at the approaching woman, now within reach of Mackenzie. Instead, in his stupor, he must have missed, because the headless corpse of a woman was thrown across the room instead. The woman with black eyes reached out for Mackenzie, but she pulled the ebon blade from her jacket and swiftly stuck it through the woman's reaching arm. The woman shrieked an ethereal yell, her skin and flesh beneath hissing and bubbling at the touch of wrought iron. Mackenzie used the opportunity to push the woman backwards, up against a nearby wall, and stuck the end of the knife firmly into place, pinning the evil woman's arm to the wall. What the hell's wrong with you? Off your game? Seth turned and asked the stumbling blue-eyed man. Apparently, my other half got my tolerance for alcoholic beverages. He drunkenly replied. Yeah, well, you didn't need to down 50 jello shots in the hour that we were there. Mackenzie yelled, doing her best to fight off the remaining arm and snapping teeth of the raging old woman. Seth moved with Jesse behind him in the direction of the man, standing resolutely still by the main entryway of the club. In the meantime, Blue Eye leaned up against a nearby wall. Just give me a moment, he said, breathing heavily. 
Once close enough, Seth pulled out a blade of his own, black and sheen, seeing the damage Mackenzie's counterpart had done, but before he could finish the motion, the elderly man moved with unnatural speed and dodged his attack, hitting Seth harder in the gut than he'd ever been in his life, and proceeded to throw him halfway across the room, causing him to land hard into the soundboard equipment. Seth! Mackenzie yelled, but her quick lack of attention was capitalized upon by the woman pinned to the wall, swiping her forearm across the side of Mackenzie's skull, knocking her hard to the floor. In one quick motion and a yank, the woman pulled the knife from the wall and her arm by the leather-bound handle and threw it to the floor, sticking it into Mackenzie's jacket, narrowly missing her flesh. No, God, no! Madison yelled, recoiling in horror at the now free woman only feet from her, causing the woman to turn her attention to her and her boyfriend behind her. With an unnatural speed, the woman moved in her direction, jittery and quick like a bolt of lightning, gripping her with one hand and lifting her into the air with ease, turning her head 360 degrees to look back at her male component, now slowly squeezing Jessie's head with so much force that her ears had begun to bleed. No! Let her go! Keith yelled, running at and attacking the woman, latching onto her side. The demonic figure threw Madison into the wall so hard, her skull collided with a loud thump and a small amount of blood, leaving her motionless in a heap on the floor. In that same moment, the woman simply snapped Keith's neck in two. Instantly, after Keith had slumped to the floor, Mackenzie and Seth still rising to their feet, not fast or close enough to get to Jesse in time. The front doors flung open with a bang, and the black-eyed elderly man was flung through the air and into the center of the club, dropping Jesse to the floor where he once stood in the process. Seth and Mackenzie were so utterly confused, they stopped and simply looked on, befuddled by what they saw. Deputy? Deputy Kramer? What the hell are you doing here? Jesse said weakly staring up to find the officer standing in the now open main doorway. Deputy Kramer didn't say a word. Instead, he simply raised a hand, snapped his two fingers together, and with a whooshing sound, in two small bursts of light, both the evil man and the woman were gone. What the... what the hell? Blue Eye stammered looking up from where he had vomited, confused by what he had just witnessed. Exactly. What the hell just about covers it? Seth reiterated. Jessie stood and rejoined her place at Seth's side, wiping away small amounts of blood from her nose and ears. Mackenzie used the opportunity to check on the girl who had been thrown into the wall. Wait, you're not from around here, are you? You're just getting that now? Let's just say, I'm from out of town, and I've got a keen interest in you lot. Officer Kramer vaguely explained. Okay, she's just unconscious. Mackenzie said to herself, finding Madison to be alive. Okay then, bub. What's the deal? What do you want? Are there some kind of warlock? My guess is a warlock. Mackenzie said, walking over to Seth and helping to hold Jessie on her feet. Warlock? God no. I'm what warlocks would aspire to be, but never get to experience. So, what are you then? And don't say you're human. That much I do know. Okay, well, that's what I would have led with. But I can see you're powerful, yet albeit a inebriated companion won't let me. I'm something your mind can't possibly believe. Your best description would be... Hell Priest? God, I love those movies. Yeah, me too. Wait a minute. So, you're a demon from hell? Eh, kinda. So we call you Meat Muppets. Do you consider yourself a Meat Muppet? My guess is no. You might consider me a demon, but it doesn't mean that I am. See, there are many planes of reality, many hells, I suppose you could say. I'm, for what you could say, is earthly hell. The place all from your plane go after your mortal existence. Pim, Seth asked, 
pointing at Blue Eye, still leaning against the wall like he depended on it. Hmm. No. He is part of something that is from a different plane of existence altogether. You guys read Lovecraft? Hell yeah. I freaking love his work. Kinda like that. Oh. Mackenzie said, almost disappointedly. Listen, why are you here in the first place? What do you want? Seth asked once again, a bit more demanding. See your friend's twin over there? The one with the red eye is up to no good. What exactly, I don't know. But something that's no good for any plan of existence, I'm here to help you stop it. Ow. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure. See, if those two meet and can join like twins in the womb, their combined power will dwarf mine and could possibly rival the power of gods themselves. Kramer explained. Wait, gods are real too? Oh, that's just great. Yeah, but for the most part, they could really give two defecations about any of us. So wait, if you don't know how to stop him yet, then why are you here, now? Seth pondered and reasoned. Listen, I know those guys. That nice utterly couple we just met, I was there when they were created. You all were done for, and I simply can't have that. Wait, what's going on? Madison softly spoke, arising to consciousness. I'll be seeing y'all real soon, Kramer said, as they turned around to look upon the awakening girl. But when they turned again to look upon him, he was gone. Well, that's great. What the hell was that all about? Mackenzie said. I have no idea, but nothing good I can imagine. Seth replied. Yeah, that right. I sure don't remember eating that. Blue Eye exclaimed, looking down at his own puddle of vomit. You okay, Jesser? Yeah, I got a bit of a headache, that's for sure, but I'll be okay. Jesse reassured him. Can, can we go to the hospital? Madison asked, scared confused and hurt. Sure, honey. I think we could both use a doctor. My squad car is out front. She told the girl. Listen, you three are gonna get me out of here and back into my old life once he sobers up, right? She asked before walking out the door. Sure thing. Come on. Let's get you a few pots of coffee. What do you say? Mackenzie suggested, leading the blue-eyed man out the door behind Jesse, heading for the Torino. Soon, the vehicles were started, and for now, each went a separate direction. But standing in the shadows, watching on with gleaming eyes and a sinister grin, was who was recently known as Officer Kramer. Everything was going exactly as he hoped, and many of the pieces were already in place. He knew that the red-eyed man was free. He knew exactly what he was looking for. But what turned his grin to a full-on wide smile was the potential he saw in the young man known as Seth. What lied in wait beneath the surface caused Kramer to barely be able to keep his excitement in check. He was determined to be a servant of none and master to all. They wouldn't even see it coming. Well, there seems to be a few more players on the board, and some may yet to be unseen, plotting in the background. What will happen next for Seth and Mackenzie? Well, you won't have to wait all that long. Confronting Evil returns next month. Social media can be very unpredictable, especially regarding horror content. If this content gets removed, all new content will be simultaneously presented on various websites provided in the description to this video. 
make sure to follow me in other digital spaces so that you never miss out on the terror. Also, if you like this video, make sure to leave a comment and hit the like button. It helps the channel a lot. If you're new to the channel and you enjoy what's here, consider hitting that subscribe button and the notification bell so that you never miss an upload. Writing is a dream of mine, and it's all of you that make that dream come true.